Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for your patience. We had a little bit of difficulty connecting today. I'm not sure what was going on, but I do appreciate your patience, and we'll go ahead and get started. So my name is Meg Saunders, and I'm an Assistant Director of Business and Technology in the UVA Career Center. Um, I'm also a double who, so I've really, really enjoyed this uh, webinar series because it's been giving me the ability to, to reconnect with a couple um, alums, fellow alums. So just so you all know, definitely look at um, Handshake for other webinars coming up. We have some finance recruitment um, webinars coming up where you'll actually be able to talk to recruiters in the finance industry um, about how to prepare for finance recruitment. And then there are a few technical or techno technology 101 and consulting 101 webinars that you can also look for. Um, if you missed previous webinars, no big deal. We have them actually recorded and they're on YouTube. So I'll actually share the link with you all in a second. And then also we have a Slack channel that we would love for you to join so that you can see um, updated banking and finance things. Before we get started tonight, um, I want to go through a little housekeeping, and I also want to thank Jen Jones from the Econ Career Services Office. Um, she has been awesome in helping us recruit these phenomenal alums. As for housekeeping, keep, please keep yourself on mute. If you want to take yourself off of mute to ask a question, you can absolutely do that, but um, other than that, just keep yourself on mute. However, feel free to keep your video on if you'd like. Um, just Note that we are recording, so if you do keep your video on, it will be, you know, seen in that recording. Um, feel free, as you have questions, if you don't want to actually unmute yourself and speak up, feel free to just drop the questions in the Zoom chat, and I will read them to the alums. And then, um, let's see, last thing. So I have found that I really enjoy watching these webinars in speaker view versus gallery view. So if you go to the top right hand corner of your Zoom account, you can actually change it from speaker view to gallery view. I think it's a better experience, but you can kind of decide for yourself. So now I wanna to introduce tonight's alums. So we have Kareem and Jamie. Kareem is a 2015 graduate of the College of Arts and Science where he majored in economics and foreign affairs. He is now an associate at Dewitch Bank. Let's see, and then Jamie is a 2019 graduate who majored in economics and currently works as a leverage finance credit research analyst at Credit Suisse. I'm really, really looking forward to today's webinar and all of the helpful tips that they're gonna share with us. So let's go ahead and kick it off. Um, Kareem, I'll start with you. Would you mind introducing yourself and explaining how you got started in the field of investment banking? Yeah, of course. And. Uh... I just have to start out by saying that I'm participating on my own behalf and my views do not constitute any statements on behalf of Georgia Bank. Um, but other than that, uh, so I graduated in 2015. Um, the summer between my third and fourth years, I had an internship at RBS um, in their investment banking group. I got it basically through just, you know, cold calling, emailing alums. Um, I also caddied at a golf club kind of the summers before that. So I would just kind of email all the members there and see if they knew of anything. Um, I did that, I applied to a bunch of places. Uh, I got an interview at RBS. I interned in their capital markets group. Uh, so I was there for the summer, got an offer to go back. Uh, and then in the March of my fourth year, RBS announced that they would actually leave the US. Uh, so basically their whole investment banking group was gonna be gone. Uh, but then my group, at RBS moved over to Mizuho, which uh, is a Japanese investment bank in New York. I joined their capital markets group, so I was there for two years, uh, covering kind of investment grade clients. And then about three years ago now, uh, I got an email from a recruiter at Deutsche Bank asking if I'd be interested in joining kind of their structured finance team, uh, interviewed there and decided to switch roles and been for three years now. Um, focusing on the aviation industry. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Jamie, could you also share um, how you got started off in the field and just introduce yourself in general? Yeah. Hi, guys. I'm Jamie. Um, I also am participating on my own behalf and nothing I say constitute any Curtis Swiss opinion. Um, I was an economics major and 
I got started out in, so I'm in sector strategy or credit research now, um, broadly speaking. So I, I'm, I work on a sales and trading floor. Sales and trading is the division of an investment bank that deals with the public side. So buying and selling of securities to public side accounts, which would be hedge funds, mutual funds, private equity funds, insurance, insurance companies. Um, but I do research on the trading floor. Um, I got started in this through some of my econ classes actually. So I was taking theory of financial markets, behavioral finance with Edwin Burton and um, I took money of banking. And so probably at the end of my second year, I thought I was interested in some type of finance role, but I mean, of course, like getting, knowing, like narrowing it down to a more specific focus. I mean, investment banking versus sales and trading is like drastically different roles. And so I wanted to start thinking what would suit my personality, what would suit my strengths more. And so Edwin Burton actually, he's one of my favorite professors and he had been in sales and trading for many years um, before becoming a professor and he was at Morgan Stanley. And so I reached out to him, I reached out to other people in different roles in finance um, through LinkedIn. And I thought sales and trading would suit me better just because, and we'll go into more, I guess, the differences, but um, it is more, I think I think of myself as a more short-term focused person. So every single day in sales and trading is different than the next, as opposed to investment banking, where you can be working on the same deal for months at a time. So I like that aspect. It's also market facing, which I like very client oriented. And I really liked the social relationship driven aspect of it. Um, and so I applied to sales and trading jobs at various banks. And I interned at Credit Suisse um, the summer after my third year and got an offer in the global credit products group. Um, and so within global credit products, you have bonds within bond, you have investment grade bonds, which would be your higher rated companies with less debt as a proportion of their earnings per year. So that would be like the Amazon, CVS, Apple. Um, I'm in high yield or leverage finance, which would be the riskier, lower credit rating companies that have more debt as a proportion of their earnings every single year. And then also in global credit products, you would have um, leverage loans, other debt products like collateralized loan obligations. So that's all in the group that I'm working for. Um, but I started out on the research side of it. Awesome. Thank you so yeah. much, Amy, for sharing. Yeah. So you mentioned that we were going to get into kind of the difference between investment banking and sales and trading. So I'd actually like to um, ask Kareem, we'll switch back to him and have you kind of explain to, to us in layman's terms what investment banking is and maybe how it's different from sales and trading. And then we'll also ask Jamie to do the, to do the same, but in opposite order. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so investment banking, I guess, in a nutshell, is you're providing kind of advisory um, and kind of advisory services to corporate clients. Um, and in that you, there are a bunch of different types of advisory you could do kind of your well-known mergers and acquisitions, you can do kind of your equity capital raises, debt capital raising. Uh, you have investment banking suites that do kind of focus on bankruptcies, restructuring. Uh, so investment banking as a whole is kind of this just giant platform uh, where there are a bunch of kind of different individual teams that might work together on some projects and not other projects. Um, my seat specifically, I kind of sit in a hybrid of capital markets and investment banking. Uh, so capital markets is you are actually talking with investors and helping your corporate clients raise money. Uh, so in my seat, I do that for aviation leasing companies by kind of structuring aircraft leases in a way that kind of you can borrow money against those leases that are for a longer term, kind of like how a mortgage works, um, but for aircraft instead. Uh, and in that, we also work with our clients and helping them acquire other platforms, um, sell themselves to platforms, help them find equity investors. Um, so it's, it's pretty interesting to see because I get to see kind of both sides to it. Um, but then also we also work with kind of the more M&A teams and the restructuring teams as well if it's kind of a bigger project. Um, thank you, Kareem. Jamie, could you let us know what um, sales and trading is in layman's terms and how you see it is different from investment banking? Yeah, so I guess so when Kareem is like, whether it's equity or whatever capital raising, that's when it first comes to the investment bank, that would be on the private side. 
So any investor who's dealing with the secondary market, this is all considered the public side. Um, so sales and trading is the division of, of the investment bank that's only dealing in the public side secondary market. So after a company raises equity or debt, it then freely trades in the secondary market. Um, and that's where the sales and trading team comes into play because our sales and trading force is going out to try in the secondary market to be buying and selling securities to the buy side account investors. Um, so within a sales and trading desk, we, you have the traders. So the traders are the ones who they have their own book or their own inventory. So they're actually keeping this inventory of securities that and taking on their own risk through buying and selling of these securities. So every day a trader is making a market um, and setting a bid and an offer, which is what you would buy and sell a security for. Um, and a trader, they have their own P&L or profit and loss every single day based on the securities that they're buying and selling. Um, so a trader's job is it, high risk, but high reward um, and and very quantitative in that you're, you're assessing what you think a bond or stock should be trading at. Um, but it also is relationship driven in that you, you're, you want to be building relationships with different brokerage accounts um, and different buy side accounts so that they want to be doing business with you. That, so that's the trading side of it. Then there, you have the sales force. So traders are um, divided by sectors. So you have a trader who specifically will cover energy stocks or bonds and gaming, et cetera. Um, then you have the sales force who's kind of, I think of it as they're working underneath the trader, but they're all, also working for the accounts that they're covering. So the sales force is divided by account coverage. And every single day you're calling up the accounts you cover and trying to get them to buy or sell what your trader is getting you to buy and sell. Um, and you're also working for your accounts and that you're trying to get transactions for them done as well. Um, and so I think of it as like you're, you have two sides to be accommodating for. Um, sales, I would say it's cerebral in that you want to be intelligent and know you want to have an understanding of this, the security or product you're trying to sell so that you can convince your account why they should be buying or selling. Um, but it's also obviously a very relationship driven role. Um, every single day, a specific buy side firm has a JP Morgan sell side analyst, Credit Suisse, Goldman, they're all coming to them to be selling the same securities and you want them to be get, coming to you to do business. Um, so a lot of sales role is building these relationships so that you can you can get business done for Credit Suisse. Um, and then my role is it's called sector strategy. And so we're working on, on the trading floor. So we're, we have the public side aspect um, and we're divided by sector. And so we cover all the different bonds or stocks. I'm specifically do bonds, but all the different bonds that our, tr our trader is trading, I cover um, from a research point of view. So what that means is I'm built, I have a financial model I'm building for every single company whose bonds that we're trading so that we can analyze the company and think if we like their bonds or don't like their bonds. <clears throat> so we're helping our traders in researching news about the company when earnings come out, where, where the earnings above expectations or below, do we like the company or not? So we're helping the trader with trade ideas, but we're also helping the sales force in that every single day the sales team is trying to sell different bonds in all these different industries. They're not, they can't un, be an expert on every single company. Um, so we help the sales force and under, if, if we have a trade that we're trying to get done, we can write up like a quick page summary and some talking points for the sales force to get on the phone and what they, how they should be convincing their accounts to buy the bonds we're trying to buy or sell. Um, so my role is really encompasses a lot of different, like we're really kind of, I guess, the, the underlying structure of like trying to help with the traders, the sales force and, and assisting with trade ideas as well. Awesome, cool. Well, thanks to both of you. I'll be honest, I'm learning right along with the students. So I'm so thankful that you all are here to, to explain this to me and to the students. Um, so we talked a lot about, you know, what you all do and it seems very um, technical skills heavy. Uh, so I'd love for you both, and we'll kind of do the same order where Kareem will go first and then we'll have Jamie. Um, I'd love for you to kind of discuss how your liberal arts majors translate it to your career. So Kareem, we'll start with you. Yeah, of course. Uh, so I think one of the most important things to remember in banking is that it's helpful to understand kind of financial modeling and how the numbers work and how, you know, all the financial statements come together. Um, with that being said, kind of every bank models 
differently. I mean, Deutsche Bank models differently than Goldman, than Citibank, than Credit Suisse. Uh, so being able to understand, I guess, concepts more than just the numbers is important. So that definitely helped me with kind of my economics background, being able to understand markets generally and kind of what's driving outcomes rather than just understanding kind of, oh, in this line of the income statement goes in this line of an Excel model. Um, and then also I think my foreign affairs background is helpful. Um, and I guess just liberal arts in more general because you are a lot of, I guess the focus on liberal arts is being able to put your ideas on paper and being able to express your ideas, which surprisingly enough is a very important skill to have in banking and not a skill that many people have. Uh, I mean, I work with people that can build a financial model in a matter of two, three hours, but having them explain what that model is saying and what the inputs are and what the output is and how that actually affects companies is very difficult for them to kind of explain uh, and kind of in layman's terms because you have to remember that a lot of your clients don't have kind of financial backgrounds. They might be, you know, corporate executives that have been at the same company for 30, 40 years. And if you explain to them kind of very, I guess, specific, um, just economic or financial terms, they just won't be able to understand it. But if you're able to put your ideas either in an email, on a presentation, in a phone call, uh, explaining what's going on, and that's a very useful skill to have. And that's definitely something that I feel my liberal arts education definitely prepare me for. Thank you for sharing, Kareem. And I will tell you, we have heard that from a lot of the finance alums, and we we are not paying you all to say that. Um, but <laughs> we've heard that from a lot of the finance alums that have spoken during, during this webinar series. Jamie, what about you? So for me, I was going to say, I touched on briefly that I took, like, I think that the econ department, there's so many classes that help with um, a finance understanding, so theory of financial markets, behavioral finance, um, the economics of money and banking and corporate finance. I took all of those and I thought they prepared me really well for my internship and just kind of grasping the basic finance concepts. Um, but really whatever job you're going into within whatever group you're going into in sales and trading, it's, it's technical and it's quantitative, but it's not rocket science and like anyone can learn what a bond or a stock is, for, I think for the most part, um, and, like understand. That's what, what I thought really prepared me is the all of my econ classes honestly coming together and making me understand like the drivers of the economy because what drives the economy is what drive, is driving the market and security pricing. And so I thought that just going in and understanding the like, different economic drivers was really helpful for me and understanding fed policy and what that means and i mean I, it was like really cool for me this year even through working through covid when the fed all these stimulus plans were coming out and they um, announced the primary and secondary market um, bond buying programs and like for me to understand from an economic background that coming into play and like oh this is open market operations and like that's what that tool is useful for and like the impact it's going to have i thought was really helpful for me um, going into that so whether it's inflation or fed policy and like um interest rate hikes or interest rate cuts um i thought that was all really helpful for me in understanding what moves the markets and therefore um impact security pricing awesome thank you thank you for that um let's see so we've talked a lot about the coursework but now i'd love to hear from each of you about um how you developed your skill set outside of coursework. So whether that's like CIOs that you were involved in or internships or just taking free courses online, if you could kind of share and maybe give some insight to students on how they could build up their um, repertoire outside of coursework. Kareem, we'll, we'll start with you. Yeah, definitely. Um, I would definitely have to say just reading a lot. Uh, I think especially when you start out reading whether it's the Wall Street Journal or let's say you have a specific blog that you really like, just being able to read it, understand what's going on, uh, being able to keep up with stuff, um, trying to see, trying to predict what's going to happen. Uh, so if you hear that kind of the ECB is lowering rates, but the Fed is keeping rates constant, trying to predict like what will happen, why is that happening, just writing down your thoughts. And then, I mean, even if you're right or wrong or even if maybe something else happens that changes that whole dynamic. Um, just being able to 
understand what's going on. Um, also, everywhere I've worked, we've always had like MSNBC on, um, kind of like the stock market channel. Uh, and they give a lot of like really good interviews. Uh, they have a lot of like, guest panels and they just go at it for 10, 15 minutes talking about what they think is going on, why they think that's happening. And I mean, even my boss would watch and then he would just like regurgitate whatever is said on that to his clients. Um, Cause he just thinks whether it's true or he might disagree. And he's like, Oh, uh, this guy said this on MSNBC this morning. I think it's ridiculous. And just having kind of like talking points. Yeah, I love that, Kareem. My husband watches that every morning when I come downstairs. <laughs> I, it's gibberish to me, so good for <laughs> counseling and not <laughs> finance. But um, that's really awesome, and I love how you were you spoke about kind of writing things down, um, and because you kind of hit on reflection and how important reflection is um, in any experience that you have, but. Um, you know, if you can write these things down and then actually see what happens and reflect on maybe why that happened versus what you had written down. That's a cool, cool concept. Um, Jamie, what about you? So going off of that, I can't stress enough the importance of reading and getting into the habit of reading, whether it's the Wall Street Journal or any news outlet as early on as you can. So I think that I might have been a little later on, like after I knew I was in the interview process then, I was like, oh, I need to be reading the Wall Street Journal a lot. I wish I had just done this earlier because I think that if you, whether it's what's happening, what's happened in the past 12 months with trade war tensions or understanding all the different events leading up to Brexit, there's so many things that it's hard to just all of a sudden start reading one day and be like, oh, okay, like I understand why this is happening now. So the sooner you can start reading and getting in the habit of being aware of what's going on in the world around you, the different global economies, that really translates into a career, whether it's in finance or not, or any type of business role. Um, so I would say the Wall Street Journal is an obvious one, but I started um, the Morning Brew. It's similar to the scam, if anyone knows that. And it's, it's every morning at like 6.30 a.m. I used to, on my 10 minute walk to work, just be kind of skimmy. It's like what the major changes in all the uh, major stock indexes, um, currency movements. It has a few major headlines if there's any deals that were announced. And I think that that it's 10 minutes in the morning of reading and it's just understanding what's going on in the world around you, kind of like I touched on before, specifically in sales and trading, since it is so market facing and current events is what's driving the markets. I think that's just so important for me was getting really outside of my coursework, really getting interested in current events. Um, and I like how Kareem touched on writing things down because when I did start, I every single morning um, before the markets opened, I would write down the Dow, S&P, NASDAQ, what the 10 year was at, um, at the close of the prior day, currencies, what gold and oil. And then if you write it down every single day and you're looking back in your notes, you're like, oh my gosh, what oil is now negative. And it was 60 degree, it was 60 for a barrel. It, a few months when I started like and then and then you start to have these reflections and you're and you're you notice even just simply writing numbers down every day then you're you have an understanding and you have more of a perception of of what's going on and so um I think that writing things down so you understand what what relative values are is really important as well yeah I love that I I, I actually get the morning brew in the skim and I read it every morning and I I think it actually it's cool because like uh, I think Kareem was saying with the numbers piece, like, of course, you have to be good at that. But then also it breaks it down, like, qualitatively, too, by kind of summarizing what what's going on for people like me who maybe the numbers aren't is like, they don't come as easily, too. Yeah, that's cool. Um, let's see. Let's go to, let's talk a little bit about um, how, so we have a lot of students who, um, they want to get into sales and trading or investment banking, and maybe they had some cool internships lined up this summer, uh, or maybe they were anticipating some internships, but they were canceled. Um, how would you suggest they use, I mean, they have pretty much exactly a month left before um, fall semester rolls around. How would you suggest they use this time to build up their skills or, um, or build up their, um, ability to, to be prepared for recruitment? Kareem, we'll start with uh, you. <laughs> I think now's a very good time 
if any, uh, to like start reaching out to alumni, maybe people at banks that you are interested at working at, guys that cover certain sectors that you might be interested in. Um, maybe for a project in an econ class, you wrote a paper on kind of, I guess, like the agricultural sector. And then you start reaching out to guys that cover the agricultural sector, specifically at different banks, whether in research or in sales and trading. Because uh, I feel like a lot of us are just sitting at home and we're definitely not as busy as we usually are in the office. And I always feel bad when I'm like in the office and we have two or three deals going on. You know, people want to, you know, try to talk to me for 10, 15 minutes, but it's always kind of difficult to kind of get a time on the calendar just because a lot of our calls have been very last minute with our clients. Um, but now that kind of deals aren't happening as much, uh, it's much easier to like get someone on the phone. And August is usually a very slow month uh, in general for the markets and kind of the new deal process just because a lot of people take vacation. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you, I would just say kind of search on LinkedIn, um, maybe talk to professors if they know of anyone in certain fields. Um, I think now is a good time for that. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. So um, students, I posted the YouTube link or the career center channel on YouTube and there's a who's in your network um, recording that actually will kind of go through some tips and tricks of networking virtually which right now everyone's kind of networking virtually so definitely check that out. Amy what about you what do you what would you suggest students utilize right now? So I think the summer specifically this summer with not as much to do is a great time to one to just prepare for the interview process whether that's researching investment banking versus capital markets versus sales and trading and reading up on the different roles to see what you're particularly interested in. And if you're going to be um, kind of going more for an investment banking role, preparing for that interview process, which is generally more technical, um, try taking your own time to learn about different financial concepts. So you think that you could be more prepared for technical, like the technical questions on interviews. And again, reading a lot because so much has happened um, in the past six, three months, six months, a year um, that you should be pre prepared to talk about in upcoming interviews. Um, again, though, this is a great time to be networking and really reaching out to people, whether it's um, through your UVA connections, going on LinkedIn, you can search different UVA alumni, different banks. Um, I didn't do that as much. And I wish I had. I think I might have felt like kind of awkward reaching out to a random person on LinkedIn before, but I think that it's risen in popularity um, maybe in the, even in a year or two. Um, so reaching out to anyone you can to get on the phone and ask them about their role, how they got there, advice that they would have to you and who's love who's, you know, you, you get on the phone with an older who they, they're, everyone's so happy to help anyone else out and would be happy to direct you to someone else that works with them or someone else who can um, give you some more insight. And so I think that this is a great time, as Kareem said, the deal pipeline is slower. Um, people are taking more vacation right now. Obviously, it's a great, like, take advantage of this slow time when people are willing and wanting to talk to you and help out. Thank you. So we actually have our first question. So Ryan asks, um, this is a question for both of you. What one to three Excel formulas are necessary to memorize slash learn for security analysis, financial modeling, et cetera? Excel formulas. That's a good question. Um, that's, I mean, I, I guess I was going to touch on this in my like outdoors, I mean, my outside of coursework skills is that at UVA I was, I did not have much of, a, of an Excel background and I now spend 12 hours a day Excel modeling. I think I went, came into the job knowing like control C, maybe control V, but I was like definitely not the Excel expert. So that's another skill that I think is great, whether, no matter what the career you want to go into is Excel is never a bad idea to sharpen your skills there. Um, for me, I generally pull, for my financial models, I'm generally pulling information from Bloomberg. Um, and so those are specific Excel formulas through Bloomberg that I'm using a lot, but I think a VLOOKUP is a great essential um, for, for many models. I, I like VLOOKUP a lot. I like learning if the and if statements, and those can get kind of tricky, and like there's, they can get kind of complex, and so I think that that's a good, um, this, when you're sorting, sorting through a lot of data that I'll be pulling from different databases on different companies, um, being able to like sort it based on if the company has um, debt outstanding greater than a billion versus not, um, if 
and if based on their credit rating, so that so the VLOOKUP um, and if statements are prob and then the general Bloomberg functions are what I use the most. Awesome, thanks, Jamie. What about you, Kareem? Uh, I use a lot of pivot tables, not really a formula, but it's kind of like a tool in itself. That's very helpful, especially when we have kind of just thousands of rows of data, kind of hundreds of planes that we need to organize, figure out kind of which plane is on lease to who for how long. Uh, so pivot tables, just like Jamie, I use VLOOKUP way too much. Um, there's kind of a, an argument in banking that's like index match or VLOOKUP, uh, and people kind of will die on their side, and I'm very much a VLOOKUP guy. Um, definitely some ifs, and especially when you kind of add additional ifs, um, which like Jamie said, they can get pretty tricky and yeah. when you get kind of like a an error statement you're like how is this an error statement and you spend like forever trying to figure it out so just being able to get comfortable on that and figure out what pulls from where yeah but in terms of like very complex like modeling and statements i mean that at least at my bank well one we have kind of a separate modeling team that handles all kind of like the heavy lifting on modeling and then also we have kind of model templates like it's very rare when someone has to build a model from scratch at our bank, um, and usually there's you can just build off the template or use a previous deal and then just like take out all the inputs and put in all of your inputs. Awesome. So um, everyone, I actually posted link to Coursera. So we just found out that um, free Coursera classes have the free ones have been extended through December. They were supposed to end at the end of July. So. Woo -woo. Um, I know that there is an Excel course on there that I've actually had my colleague Drew has taken and he said it was a really awesome um, course. He showed me some of the things he's learned on it. So definitely suggest um, taking that free all online, all self-paced course. Um, you can start it as early as tonight. It's, it's easy to sign up. So uh, I'd love for you all to kind of give us some insight into um, what maybe you would have told yourself if if you had to look back at yourself going through recruitment what would you tell yourself now and then also any insight in going into recruitment virtually because everyone's going to pretty much be doing recruitment virtually this year so you could hit on again what you would have told yourself going through recruitment and then also what you would have told yourself going through recruitment virtually so kareem if you could um start start with with that yeah, um, good question. I think what I would have told myself if I could go back, probably just be kind of, you know, I guess like walk before you can run um, and definitely take advantage of kind of all the resources that you have when you start out. Uh, because everyone, I feel everyone's usually very kind of helpful to all the new hires and all the interns. So if you want to sit down with kind of the chief economist for 10 minutes or grab lunch with them, they're usually very kind of open to that if they have an open day or if they, you know, they're not traveling. Um, and I definitely wish I took more advantage of that when I was younger. Um, and what I would tell myself if I was doing recruitment virtually. Um, maybe interviewing virtually, that may be a, a more focused thing for you to speak to. Yeah, interviewing would probably be I always feel like it's very difficult to get kind of reads on people virtually, um, just kind of reading body language and it's like the atmosphere of the room. You could usually do that pretty well in a physical interview. I mean, I feel like nine times out of 10, you know whether you got the job or not before the interview is over, um, but that might not be the case in a virtual interview. So I would just say kind of probably don't get discouraged. And um, I guess it's gonna be a lot less kind of body language intensive than Absolutely. what we've had and it's definitely it's also a new concept to the guys on the other side of the room so where we sit we haven't done many kind of virtual interviews so we're also like learning as we go and figuring out how this all works so I guess yeah. it's just like a new concept to everyone yeah absolutely Jamie what about you so the advice I would give if I was going to recruiting again would be like really well, uh, one, it would be to read a lot, of course. <laughs> so start, just, everyone start reading a lot now. Um, two would be to really put yourself out there and to not feel 
like you're annoying people or kind of feel shy, like really getting yourself out there because people are aggressive. Everyone, know, everyone knows what it's like to be searching for your first job. You, you want it and every, it's competitive. Um, so reach out to as many people you can and utilize your resources, whether it's Jen and Meg at the, you know, at the econ center, they're great. And I remember Jen helped me with before my interview and I would call her up and, she, and you have so many amazing resources at UVA, but then with your, your, the UVA alumni network is also great. And people, like I said, I get really excited when someone from LinkedIn, even if they go to Duke or UNC, anyone reaching out to me, I'm like, oh, like this college kid, I'm right out of college. I know what that's like. I'd love to get on the phone with them. But if it was a, if it was a UVA kid, I'd be like, oh my gosh, let's get on the phone right now, you know? So, so like searching through LinkedIn, um, UVA people working in sales and trading or investment banking, do your research, send 50 people messages if you want, and you're going to get a lot of responses. And talk to as many people as you can and you'll be surprised by how many people you talk to who after they talk to you are then like, oh my gosh, I'm going to connect you to this person at Credit Suisse. And, and, then, and then before you know it, you now have a, a first round interview lined up. Um, and so that's what I would stress is really, you can have a really impressive resume and application, but there's thousands of people applying for the same job. And so what gets you through the door is if you took the time to reach out to specific people and someone knows your name and someone talked to you and can say, oh, I, I talked to that girl on the phone, she's great. Um, so that would be the one thing is like reach out to as many, talk personally to as many people as you can. Um, going virtually, I would say the, I and mean, something I'm seeing right now with the interns, um, it's unfortunate that so much of, whether it's the interview process or the internship process evaluation is um people skills and you know and it's obviously harder in a virtual setting to let your personality really show uh so i would say if you have the ability to if, if someone lives near you and you can do a socially distanced coffee chat uh that would be in that's you know think outside the box here um or if you could do a zoom chat and put your camera on so at least there's more of a personable um environment so things like that i would say it's it's harder from a recruitment because like, so much of that is relationship driven and and getting to know show your personality so obviously that brings more challenge but if you can do video calls meet in person with someone um i think that would be really helpful in this time awesome yeah thanks jamie awesome. yes Green. i was just gonna say one thing i always tell people and jamie i don't know what your thoughts are on this but i always recommend that people put kind of their hobbies and interests on their resume because like Jamie said, it makes you seem more like a person. Um, and you never know. I mean, we had someone put down that they want, like they went surfing in Australia last summer and they loved it. And turns out that we had an Australian surfer on the desk and he was like, we need to bring this person in for an interview. And so we did that. But I feel like a lot of the resumes that we get that don't have that, it just kind of seems like a bunch of kind of numbers and doesn't really put like uh more of a story behind the person. I love that. I really love that. So I know that the million dollar question and all the students are probably wondering this right now, is it okay with you all if they connect with you on LinkedIn? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> all right, students, have at it. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I've got more questions, but I'd like to give time to the students to ask um, questions of their own. So please students go ahead and bounce your questions into the um, chat while while we wait, I'll ask um, one question that I just like to hear from from each alum that I speak to. So I like to hear your favorite thing about your job and your least favorite thing about your job. So Kareem, I'll have you start. Yeah. Um, so my favorite thing about my job, and I guess this is, I guess kind of especially specific to my role, um, is everything can change in a day. Um, so, I mean, there have been deals that we've been working on that, you know, we were working on a deal at the end of last year where we priced the deal on a Tuesday and we were going to close the deal. Uh, so kind of like wire the money to the client the next Tuesday. And on Thursday, one of the airlines went bankrupt and no one expected it. So we kind of had to figure out in a span of, kind of three or four days, all right, what are we going to do? What's the deal going to look like now? What do investors want? What do the clients want? Um, and especially, I mean, with coronavirus, I mean, in March, um, we had, I think, 
four or five deals in the pipeline and we thought it was going to be like our busiest deal ever and now everything changed like the entire aviation market changed within the span of three to four months uh, so i think that's super interesting and kind of keeps us all on our toes um you my least favorite thing a lot of changes recently <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, and I'd say probably my least favorite part is probably all the egos that I have to deal with. Um, especially kind of like being the youngest person in the room. Um, you'll be on calls with kind of your like CEO of a company, your managing director and a partner at a law firm. And they all have like, they all want to get their word in and they all think that they're right. And just being able to kind of navigate that. And sometimes it kind of delays the deal and, People are like, oh, I've been doing this longer than you have, so I'm the one that's right. It could just get like frustrating sometimes, but it, it has its entertaining moments, definitely. Also, <laughs> politics, yes. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Jamie? Um, my favorite thing about the job, I would say, is I really like the environment of sales and trading. So it's very competitive and it's it's kind of almost like a teamwork feel so there's a lot of camaraderie on the floor um, my group specifically there's a lot of like energy and people are very like high energy loud fun people and so I think that the camaraderie on the floor it's something that makes work going to work every day really exciting um, and so it is it's a lot of competitive people I'm a competitive person so I, I guess I like there's a big natural drive and motivation that I feel every single day when I go to work. Um, so I would say the environment is fun and exciting and I like how every single day is different than the next. Um, so that's what I like most. What I like the least about it is the hours. Um, it, I mean, the, we get there before the market opens for um, meetings with the entire sales force throughout the day. So I'm getting to work, I was getting to work around 6.45, sometimes 6.30, and I would, I'm would. i very much not a morning person. I took 8 a.m. accounting, or, um, UV, I think I had, and I remember that was miserable. And I was like setting 20 alarms to get to 8 a.m. Um, class on like Monday and Wednesday. And so it was a big adjustment for me. And I would say though that you do get adjusted <laughs> and, and it's coming, like I said, like since I like, um, it's a very fast paced and high energy environment that I do get to work and even when I'm tired, you are quickly awake. Um, so I would say the hours is for me getting up early is an obvious um, disadvantage, I guess, but I don't work that late. So you get in early, but once you're adjusted to it, I, I now work out before work, which wakes me up more naturally. So I'd say, yeah, I think for, for people who aren't, aren't morning people, it can be tough at first, but I, if I can get adjusted, I think anyone can. <laughs> awesome. And now, um, let's see, Michael is asking, if you changed your mind about your career, how difficult would it be to switch to a different area in finance? Question. Kareem, do you want to? Within finance? Mm -hmm. um, different area. Actually, yep. Um, like within, I assume this means like within a bank, like if you don't like investment banking, switching to sales and trading. Um, yeah, sounds like it. Um, it's actually pretty easy. Um, we actually had a few people in our group kind of come from sales and trading, come into our group. We had a few people in our group go to sales and trading because we kind of work with them a lot. Um, I would say don't do it within like your first six months. Um, I would say give it a little bit of a shot, but I mean, if you're there and you have been working with a certain team or networking with a certain team at in a different part of the bank and you feel like you get along with them really well and the work really interests you, then I would always say that banks are always more willing to let you switch within the bank than having you leave and go somewhere else. Um, so it's actually, and we even have like an internal like job posting site. Um, so it shows kind of different job openings that aren't necessarily open yet to kind of the outside world to see if anyone's interested in them and in different locations too. Like if you're interested in, going to work in London, they post those jobs there. So definitely pretty easy for sure. Yeah. Um, I think sales and trading is a little bit more difficult after you go into sales and trading. Um, it's not as transferable, but even still, even if you're in sales and trading versus capital markets versus investment banking, they're all interconnected. So 
we work with the capital markets team before they bring a new issue um, if they're like the lead left on the deal. And so we work with the different groups, even though we're, we're a different division. So I think that once you get started at a certain bank, moving internally wouldn't, it isn't always difficult if there's spots open because you are always interacting with the different parts of the bank, no matter what group you're in. Um, but for my role, I think that research is very transferable. And so I think that's one of the things I like about it is I think that if you can get the fundamentals down of credit analysis and, and if you, if you know how to analyze a credit, you, you're also understanding how to value the entire company. Cause if you understand how to analyze their debt, you have to understand how to analyze their equity in the entire company. And so I think that that could be, if I wanted to go buy side and work for a credit fund um, down the road, I think that there's definitely more opportunities, even if I were to switch um, to buy side, not even internally at Credit Suisse. So I definitely think that a research role um, prepares you to uh, transfer to a bunch of different areas in finance. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I think generally as we, as a career counselor, I always talk to people about how they can find those transferable skills because everything has transferable skills that you're gaining. Um, even part-time jobs that you work over the summer have a ton of transferable skills that you can take to a full-time job in the future. So thanks for mentioning the transferable skills side. Um, let's see. So Carolina has a question. Um, while we wait, oh, Carolina would like to speak. Yes. <laughs> so um, when I was like applying to internships now and stuff, um, like I know at Credit Suisse, when you apply, it has like global capital markets, internship, dash sales and trading. And at other banks, they have them as completely different like applications and divisions to work in. So what are like the similarities and differences and why is there like that overlap? Yes, um, I can answer that first. So Credit Suisse, I know that they specifically, like they blend the internship, but I think I'm pretty sure unless they changed it, that if you want to go into capital markets, you're in capital markets the whole time. It's just all under the global markets division. Uh, the reason that they're interconnected and that we've had people from sales and trading go to capital markets and vice versa is because the capital markets team, they're the ones who bring, if, if a company comes to them and they're going to be um, issuing debt, the capital markets team is the one working with them on the deal, um, whether it's choosing if it's going to be unsecured or an unsecured bond coming up with the coupon and like they're structuring the new deal, but they're working with the sales and trading team as well, because after the, the new deal is brought to market, we're the ones obviously selling it in the secondary market. So we have our sales and trading team working with the capital markets team after the deal is brought. Um, Cause if you think about that too, they, they're getting before the deal is officially brought, like the sales and trading team is talking to their announced to kind of gauge interest. And like, if they're, if, it, if the deal is going to be oversubscribed, they're going to need to lower the coupon or if, if they're not getting enough interest, they're going to need to make the coupon payer um, higher so that they can get more interest. Um, and then in my specific role for sector strategy, if a cap, if capital markets is working on a deal in a sector, I cover, I'm actually, it's called being wall cross. So then I'm led into private side information just for that specific deal. So before the deal is released publicly, I get to work with the capital markets team um, to talk to, to talk to different investors and talk to the company um, about different questions investors will ask and um, how we're going to kind of spin this to buy side accounts. And so they're in they're interconnected because after the capital markets team brings a deal, they want, they want the, the debt to perform well in secondary markets. So we're all kind of working together as a team to make the best transaction for the company. So if the company comes back to credit, so if they want to have an, um, raise more money and issue more debt, you want them coming back to credit Swiss so we can be on the deal. So you want them to get the best rate, but then you also, and you also want the debt to perform well in the secondary markets, which is where the sales and trading like teamwork aspect comes into play. Thank you. <laughs> So I um, think that that leads me to another question that I think students are probably wondering. Um, could each of you go through kind of what your interviews, what your firm's interviews are like, um, behavioral and technical? Yeah, Kareem, do you want to start or I can start? Uh, yeah, sure. So usually what we do is we have kind of an initial screening interview might be over the phone. Um, if you kind of 
if you're in the area, um, we would have you come in. I don't know how we're going to do it. Now it's probably going to be all over Zoom or Skype, um, but we might have kind of first two interviews would be with kind of a more junior person, analyst or an associate, kind of just get a feel for the person, see if they're actually interested in the role, uh, if they might be a good team fit, if they could see themselves working with them. They might ask a few technical questions, um, but not too much. It's definitely first is more of a behavioral interview. Um, and then if you pass that, the way we do it is then you meet with kind of the more senior people, directors or managing directors, and they kind of have the final say. And they, it really depends on who the person is, but I feel like that's always a bit more technical. They might ask you where you see the market in six months. Um, they might ask you a very specific modeling question, like if you have a certain amount of net income, what does that do to your EBITDA or something like that? Um, and they might also just try to see if you are a good fit for the team, but I feel like that comes down more to kind of the analysts and associates and they'll be training you and they'll be working with you more. Yeah. Um, for sales and trading, I would say my, I think that all interviews for Credit Suisse, I think are very personalized towards your resume. So for the most part, you aren't going to get, if you have on your resume that you last summer worked for a hedge fund, they might be like, oh, you worked for a CLO manager. They might, they're going to make sure that you understand what a CLO is or that you, um, that you understand the work that you did there. But if you don't have any finance background on your resume, which is okay, they, they interview English majors, history majors, like they really do try to emphasize that a finance background is not necessary. So if you don't have any finance background on your resume, you're most likely not gonna get asked about it. But if you do, you're expected to, know, to be able to talk about anything on your resume. And that's a really general rule of thumb wherever you're interviewing is be prepared to talk about anything you're listing on your resume. Um, but I would say most of it is behavioral and that they wanna assess the kind of person you are. Um, like, like I said, sales and trading is, mostly a personality fit. Um, so I think that I got a lot of questions centering around how I work as a team and like providing um, examples of teamwork skills or when I was a leader or a time that I was flustered or had a short-term project that I didn't think I could meet the deadline for. Questions like that to see how you handle pressure, um, your work ethic, how you interact with people. So it's a lot of behavioral questions. Um, and then for technical questions, you could, it's again, assessing that you read and understand what's going on in the market. So they could ask you, well, what, uh, what have you read on the Wall Street, in the Wall Street Journal in the past week? If, if there's a major event that just happened, like the Fed announces a rate cut, they could ask you about that to make sure that you're aware. Um, so it's questions I would say that are more market driven. Um, they might ask you if, if, if you're interviewing for Credit Suisse or Goldman or whatever, they might ask you what the stock price is that day. Like, they, it's not as common, but you do you do get people that just want to know like, that you're coming into the interview totally prepared and did your research. Um, so you could get some, and that's why I, I do think that writing down like the stock indexes and that what the ten years at every day, like those are always fair questions that someone could just make sure that you understand what the ten years at or just the, the general range it would be at. Um, so I think that you wouldn't get a lot of like financial modeling, technical questions, but more it would be like a current events type technicals. Awesome. Well, Kareem and Jamie, thank you so much. We're actually, we're two minutes, well, one minute till time. So I don't want to keep you all long, longer. I know that um, you all may have to even go back to work. So definitely <laughs> don't want to keep you longer than necessary. Um, I'm just so grateful that you were here. Um, I know the students are appreciative and I'm appreciative. So um, students, let's just, you know, join in thanking Jamie and Kareem for their time. Um, I know it's busy, busy schedule, but I hope you all have a great rest of your summer. And please let us know if there's anything we can do for you in the Career Center. Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm happy that I could be part of this today. And I would love if everyone wants to connect with me in LinkedIn, schedule a phone call. I'm always, I'm happy to help and answer any questions that people have off this. Thank you. Yeah. Same here. Awesome. Well, that concludes our, our I keep saying show, but that concludes our <laughs> <program>. <laughs> Bye, y'all. <laughs>